Praise the Lord, friends. We're going to answer the question today, has God written off the Jewish people? And we're actually going to be teaching from one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible to explain, and that is Romans chapter 9. But I believe if you'll stay tuned, you'll get some great revelation and find out how everyone can receive right standing with God. It's not about what we do, but it's about who we believe. Friends, I'm so glad that you're here today. We're going to be talking about Romans 9, and Romans 9 is actually one of the most challenging uh, chapters of the Bible, depending on your viewpoint. But I believe we're going to bring some great revelation from our perspective, and that is faith righteousness, that it takes faith in God to receive righteousness uh, from Romans chapter 9. And you need to understand that when we look into Romans 9, 10, and 11, God is talking about his plan of righteousness for the Jews and Gentiles. So Aaron, will you read Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 5? Sure, yeah. So Romans 9, starting in verse 1, it says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom are and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So he begins to talk about his heart for the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, I wish I were accursed in verse 3 from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And he begins to talk about in verse 4 in verse 5 what the Jewish people uh, actually have as a heritage. He says they're Israelites. They have the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises. They have the fathers. And Christ came in the flesh. They are God blessed forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people think that God has written off the Jews. But when you study Romans chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11, you'll find out that God has not written off the Jews. Mm -hmm. That is an uh, absolute lie. In fact, we'll see this in Romans 10, 1. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And he goes on in Romans 11, 1, and he, he asks this question, Has God cast away his people? God forbid. So he uses that same term. That's absolutely not the truth. So God has not written off the Jews. God has a plan for righteousness for the Jews, for the Gentiles, and it's faith in Jesus Christ to receive righteousness. I like what Paul said, um, that he said, I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. So he's saying, I love, I love my brethren. I love my family. I love my community. I love the people I grew up with. I love my friends so much that I, I would become a curse for them that they might know Jesus, that they might be saved. That's kind of, that reminds me of the love of Jesus for us. Like Jesus right. became a curse for us right. so that we might be blessed. So Paul is saying, I love them with the same love that Jesus loves them and loves right. me. So And God loves everyone. Mm -hmm. He loves every saints and sinners, uh, religious and you know, where he just, he loves everybody. And he has not written off the Jewish people. That is absolutely not true. And you can see it here in Romans 9, 10, 11. I know some people uh, that teach that, they just uh, ignore what the scripture says. People believe what they believe sometimes, mm -hmm. don't even care what the Bible says. So the first question that we have as we get into these scriptures is in Romans 9, 6 through verse 13, is who has God chosen? And if you don't understand, you see, you have to take the Bible in context with what's being said. And everything that has been said into Romans up to this point has said that you receive righteousness by faith in God's grace, that God has a plan of righteousness, that God is, the gospel is the revelation of righteousness and the just live by faith. The Gentiles need righteousness, caught up in philosophy, idolatry, lust, all kinds of ungodliness. That's Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, 
the Jews, religious people need righteousness. They're caught up in performance. Romans chapter three says everybody needs righteousness. Mm -hmm. And God provided that righteousness in Jesus. He tells us in chapter four, we receive it by faith. He tells us in chapter five, when we receive righteousness, we go from the law of sin and death to the uh, reign of grace and righteousness through faith in Jesus. Then in Romans chapter six, he says, now since we're righteous, we're dead to sin. Romans chapter seven says we're dead to the law. And Romans chapter eight says we have life in the spirit. But who has God chosen? Let's look at this. In verse 6, Romans 9, 6, not as though the word of God had not taken no effect, for they are not all Israel, which are Israel. In other words, what I believe Paul is saying here is not everyone who is natural Israel uh, has entered into the covenant, mm -hmm. because you have to get into the covenant by faith. I remember, this kind of reminds me of a story of uh, when I was a freshman in college. I was going to college in Pittsburgh, and a uh, uh, one of my classmates, I was walking um, to class with her. She was a musician like, like me, studying music. And um, she, she was of a, a Jewish heritage, but very secular. But um, they were actually Messianic Jews handing out tracts um, to students that were trying to tell people about Jesus. They were Messianic Jews. And, and she just took the track and threw it on the ground in front of them and said, I'm a real Jew, and, and like stormed <laughs> off. And she's someone who's you know kind of liberal politically and, and claims to be very accepting and tolerant. But I just uh, thought that was very interesting. Yeah. And it kind of goes along with this verse here that all, all who claim to be part of Israel are not really Israel. God has no grandchildren. You yeah. have to put faith in Jesus to be saved, whether you're... Uh, born a natural Israelite or whether you're born a Gentile. There's mm -hmm. only one way to receive righteousness, and that's by faith in Jesus. Abraham received righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. Noah received righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. We can read that in Hebrew chapter 11. He goes on and says in verse 7, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. So uh, Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And this gets into where... You know, people are really begin to talk about sovereignty and different things, mm -hmm. uh, Calvinism, like you were talking about. But if you understand what he's talking about, when he's talking about Isaac, Isaac represents the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And you've got to put your faith in the grace of God to be saved. Um, but Ishmael, you know, Ishmael represented, you know, the law or, or you know, and, and Ishmael didn't receive righteousness. Mm, Esau. Um, Esau. Yeah. yeah. Well... Esau represents unbelief when we mm -hmm. get down into Jacob and uh, Esau. We'll talk about that. Now, he says in verse 8, that is, they who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So what do you have to do to receive the promise? Well, if you go back to Romans 4, verse 13 to verse 16, you receive the promise by faith in God's grace. So you have to believe to receive the promise. You receive the promises of God the same way that you see, receive righteousness. He says in verse 9, for this is the word of the promise at that time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca has conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children. Now this is talking about the two children, Jacob and Esau, in Rebecca's womb. He said, the children being yet not born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calls. That is a great grace verse. Uh -huh. In fact, I have prayed that for my own life, uh -huh. that the purpose of God according to election stands, uh, not of works, but of him that calls, because God has called us by his grace mm -hmm. into salvation. He called us at the cross. Now you have to answer that by faith to receive what he has. Now he says, he goes on and says in verse 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger as it's written, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Now we, we talked about how Isaac represents grace, but when we look at this, we could say that Jacob represents faith and Esau represents unbelief. Mm -hmm. And if you look at their lives, it, it shows up. In fact, I wrote 10 things in Jacob's life that really are an expression of faith. Mm -hmm. So you could change this scripture and, and put it in there because what he's talking about, and you could say, faith have I love, but unbelief have I hated. Mm -hmm. And then it makes complete sense. And God loves everybody, but you've got to choose to believe him. And you know what? God will let you go to hell over the 
body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It is not his will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Mm -hmm. You see, to interpret scripture correctly, you've got to use the scripture. Mm -hmm. And 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, it's God's will that all would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. It's God's will for everybody to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Everything in the scripture says that. And you don't just pull these scriptures out and make a doctrine out of them separate from all the rest of the book of Romans and all the rest of the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's like ludicrous. People do crazy things like that all the time. So when the people that are God, God has chosen are the people who've chosen to believe in the grace of God, right? And people of faith, but not people of unbelief. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you'll turn around and repent and choose to believe, you can receive the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Now, what about Pharaoh? Let's talk about this in the next few verses. In verse 14 uh, through verse 23, Paul begins to talk about Pharaoh. So, Aaron, why don't you read verse 14 through verse 18? Sure, yeah. It says, uh, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on, on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that shows mercy. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, has hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will hardeneth. So why uh, did God, why, why did, you know? Well, this is, this, I think this is like God saying, I'm raising up Pharaoh for a purpose, even though Pharaoh, you know, um, hurt the children of Israel and, and um, fought against God's will. God, God took that situation. Pharaoh did that, but God took that situation and turned it around and used it to, to, Manifest his, right. his power. But Pharaoh was hard hearted. Yeah. And I put in here, don't be a knucklehead. Mm -hmm. You know, Pharaoh, I mean, and because he was hard hearted, I mean, it proves his hard heartedness. God sent 10 different plagues. At the second one, when the frogs came, Pharaoh said, Hey, I'll let him go. Just get rid of the frogs. Mm -hmm. And so Moses said, Well, when do you want me to get rid of the frogs? He said, Tomorrow. I mean, they had frogs in their beds, frog in their refrigerator, frogs in their kitchen, frogs in their cooking dish. I mean, there were frogs everywhere. Mm -hmm. What kind of a knucklehead says tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Say right now, get rid of them right now. You know what? He got what he, he said. But, you know, it took him, you know, another eight plagues and finally the loss of his own son. And all the firstborn children of Egypt died except those who put their houses in the houses of the Hebrews that had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Yeah. And whoever, whoever was in the house, it didn't matter whether you're Gentile or Jew. There, there were a multitude uh, of different people that came out of Egypt, a uh, mixed multitude of people, those people who put faith in the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. Praise God. God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. So judgment passed over, but Pharaoh hardened his heart and God used that to magnify himself. Well, I think that's, that's important to note too, that, that even though God used it to magnify himself and to, to show his power, that doesn't mean that God w was the one causing Pharaoh to act that way or the one causing, you know, the Egyptians to oppress the Israelites. God didn't cause that, but he took a bad situation and, and turned it around. Yeah. But that, uh, the vast majority of Christians today think, well, this is a bad thing. And because something good is going to come out of it, that means that <laughs> God caused this bad thing. I just heard a very famous minister say that God, out of his mercy, puts people through a furnace of affliction. And that, that is not God's mercy. That is not the truth. That is not what the Bible says. They have not read John 10.10. 10. I'm sure that person you're talking about read John 10.10. 10. Mm -hmm. But they don't have a revelation of John 10.10. 10. They don't have a revelation of John 3.16. Mm -hmm. They don't have a revelation mm -hmm. of um, James chapter 1, verse 17. Okay, so here, Pharaoh was, was working in tandem with the enemy, with Satan, with the devil. He was stealing, killing, and destroying. Right. He, you know, that, that wasn't God. But God used the hardness of Pharaoh's heart to magnify himself mm -hmm. and bless his people Israel. God turned that situation around. Yeah. Let's go on and read in verse four, uh, 19 to verse 23, where he's talking about uh, Pharaoh still. 
He says, you will say then, why does he yet find fault for who has resisted his will? The answer is right here in the scripture. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh resisted the will of God. Mm -hmm. If you resist the will of God, God will let you see then your rebellion. Not that he wants to, but you know yeah, what? Pharaoh probably re your... resisted the will of God almost more than any man in human history. Just think yeah. about everything that was and happening. All the, and he kept resisting over and over. That's what this is talking about. He was about. probably the most hard-hearted person to ever walk on the face of the One earth. One of them. He says, no, but, O oh man, who are you that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why as you made me thus? Doesn't the pow uh, potter have power over the clay? The same lump makes one vessel to honor, another to dishonor. Now, if you study 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 21, we are the ones who choose to be a vessel of honor. We're the ones who choose that. 2 Timothy 2, verse 20 and verse 21. He says this in verse 22. Look at this. What if God, willing to show his wrath and make his power known, endured much long suffering the vessels that were of wrath that were fitted to destruction. Mm -hmm. In other words, it says that God was very patient. He was mm -hmm. very long suffering, even with Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. These people who are, you know, hell bent, you know, that it's their choice. You know what? Just like I said before, God will let you go to hell over the body and the blood of Jesus, over the cross of Jesus Christ, over the blood of Jesus Christ, it is not his will. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be a lot of people in hell because they didn't choose to believe. They rejected Jesus mm -hmm. and they, they, you know, are stubborn. Don't be stubborn. Mm -hmm. Don't be a knothead. Don't be a knucklehead. That's what Pharaoh was. He says that he might make known the rich of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he afore prepared to glory. In other words, God was still merciful with Pharaoh, but at the end, Pharaoh was judged because he hard, if Pharaoh would have softened his heart, God would have had mercy on him, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. He just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Now, we're gonna be back in just a few seconds, and I'm gonna talk about the 10 aspects of faith in the life of, life of Jacob really quickly before we finish this out. And man, it, it's Romans 9 has a powerful end, so stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Friends, I've been teaching from my series on Romans, the revelation of righteousness. Romans is actually my favorite book of the Bible, and I teach this class. I've been teaching it for years at Karis Bible College in Woodland Park with Andrew Womack. And so I'm teaching about the gospel is the revelation of righteousness. You want to get a hold of this. I have a book on it. I also have a four C CD mini teaching on it. And then most recently, we've done the 16 teaching USB that you can get just as we've been teaching it here on television. And so you want to get a hold of this revelation. If you get a hold of this revelation, it will change your life. So Romans, the revelation of righteousness. Thanks so much for being with us today. I'm sure that you'll enjoy this great teaching and you'll want to share it with your friends. Blessings. We appreciate you. Praise the Lord, friends. I'm so glad that you stayed tuned in. We're, we've been talking about, you know, who did God choose? And God chooses people who choose to receive his grace. And he gave his grace in Jesus. And when we looked at Isaac in Romans 9, verse 6 through verse 13, Isaac represents grace and Jacob represents faith. Esau represents unbelief. So sometimes when people read this scripture in Romans 9, verse 13, it says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. If you real, realize that Jacob represents faith, then you could say, faith, I have loved. God loves faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But unbelief have I hated. God hates unbelief uh -huh. because it limits people in receiving his love. Now, I talked about 10 aspects of faith that I could see in the life of Jesus or the life of um, Jacob. And it, first of all, he respected the birth, birthright. Secondly, he received the blessing. Thirdly, he vowed when he was running from his brother Esau, he vowed to give a tenth of all that God would give him back to him. You know, God blessed him when he came back. He gave Esau a gift of like over a million dollars in today's terms mm -hmm. of livestock. And that was just part of his property. He went out with a loincloth and a staff and came back 14, 15 years later with 
tremendous wealth uh -huh. because of this covenant that he had with God. He honored the covenant of family. He went to Laban's house to find a wife. He prospered in the house of Laban. Laban said, I have learned by experience, this is Genesis 30, verse 27, that God has blessed me for your sake. He obeyed God to return to his homeland. He prayed to God when he returned. He was afraid, ultimately, of Esau, but he prayed to God, and God changed his name. That's my next thing. His name was changed to Israel when he met God as a prince you have power with God and have prevailed. That's what Israel means. He worshiped the God of Israel finally in Genesis 33 verse 20, and he built an altar in Bethel in Genesis 35 verse 14 and verse 15. So Jacob was a man of faith and faith pleases God. It's faith that pleases God and it's faith that enters in and receives what grace has provided. So sometimes people are trying to say about Romans 9, well, God chooses some to go to heaven and chooses some to go to hell. I don't believe that there's any scripture that God says that God chose anybody to go to hell. And I believe it's God's will for everybody to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. I got scripture on it, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. It's God's will for everybody to be saved. I have scripture on it. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. So I'm going to go with what the scripture says. That's Amen. Awesome. Now, are there going to be people go to hell? Yeah, because God gives people their own free will. Let's go and begin to finish this up in verse 24 uh, to verse 29. Uh, it, it continues to talk about God's promise. And it talks about how God's promise is greater than our performance. He talks about Hosea and Isaiah and some of the promises they made. So Aaron, why don't you read uh, Romans 9, verse 23 to 29. Now that he might make known the riches of his glory of the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he has called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he said also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cries concerning Israel, Though the number of children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work with the Lord make, will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. So basically, a couple of scriptures here uh, that God made promises to Israel when Israel was uh, backsliding. But in Hosea, Hosea is a beautiful picture of the love of God and basically God told the prophet Hosea to go marry a prostitute. Mm -hmm. And he said, basically, Hosea's love, and he married Gomer. And when he married Gomer, they had three children. And these three children represent, their names represent what Israel de deserved. And the first one was Jezreel, you deserve judgment. The second one uh, was uh, Lo Ruhama. Yeah, you don't deserve mercy. And the third child was Lo Ami, no child of mine. Most people believe that what happened was Gomer went out and played the wildlife and this uh, last child was not his. And so God said, this is you deserve judgment. You don't deserve mercy and you don't deserve to be called my children. But then he says in Hosea 1, 10 through uh, chapter um, 2 and verse 1, 1, 10 and 11, and, and then chapter 2, verse 1. What, I, what uh, Paul quotes in Romans here in Romans chapter 10 and verse uh, 25, he says, I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved uh, which was not beloved. And he says, you are not my people. They will, be called, they will be called the children of God. That was God's covenant. And God's mercy is greater than our performance. Mm -hmm. So God said, this is what you deserve. You deserve judgment. You don't deserve mercy. You don't deserve to be called my people, but I'm going to call you my people. And Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9, Isaiah said, though the number of the children of Israel be of the sand of the sea, a remnant will be saved, for he will uh, cut it, finish the work and cut it short. So even though there's judgment, God said there's mercy, and a number of uh, Israelites are going to be saved. And we'll find out when we study Romans chapter 11 in a couple of days that 
when you look at Romans chapter 11, essentially what happened when Israel rejected Jesus as a whole, the Israeli nation rejected Jesus, then the Gentiles were grafted in. But in the last days, God says, he's gonna graft Israel in again. Mm -hmm. And there's gonna be salvation in Israel. Now, he finishes this up and talks about who receives righteousness in Romans 9, 30 to 33. Aaron, do you wanna read that? Romans 9, 30. Sure. Uh, what shall we say then that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. So this is really powerful, but essentially what he begins to say is you don't receive righteousness because of what you do, uh -huh. but you receive righteousness because of who you believe. And he said the Gentiles receive righteousness because they believe Jesus. And the Jews as a whole did not receive righteousness because they were trying to receive righteousness by their performance and they stumbled at Jesus. Uh -huh. So what you do with Jesus, your faith in Jesus is what gives you righteousness. As it said, behold, I lay in Zion, verse 33, a stumbling stone. This is Jesus, a rock of offense. And whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. You know what? If you believe on Jesus, you do not need to be ashamed. Amen? Mm -hmm. Whether you're a Gentile, whether you're a Jew, just put your faith, put your hope, put your confidence in Jesus. He goes on to say in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, that Christ is the end of the law. He is the end of performance for righteousness to everyone who believes. And that's a powerful verse. It's not because of what we did. It's because of what Jesus did that we are saved. If you need prayer today, if you need to receive Jesus as your Savior, if you uh, need to receive healing, if you need somebody to agree with you for finances, whatever it is, just give us a call. We have trained prayer ministers ready to minister to you. Blessings. Jesus is the answer for every need that the world faces today. In this package, containing Romans, the Revelation of Righteousness, CD, USB, and book, you'll learn how to receive righteousness and what happens when you do. You can get this special package for $49 when you call 719-418-4000 or visit karischristiancenter.com. Hi friends, I'm Pastor Lawson Purdue, and I'm gonna have my good friend, Jesse Duplantis ministering here at Karis Christian Center. He's ministered for us every year for the last 11 years. One thing he said that really has helped me, he said, in the realm of faith, most of the time I made a decision and God honored it. So you don't wanna miss these meetings with Jesse Duplantis. Come and receive the good word of God. Blessings. Thanks for watching Grace for Today. This broadcast has been made possible by our faithful partners. If you would like to become a partner, need prayer, or have a question, please call us at 719-418-4000. Or to partner online, go to charischristiancenter.com slash give. You can write us at P.O. Box 63733, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80962. See you next time on Grace for Today.